Legends are born. They're created, ladies and gentlemen. And perfect theme music for today's episode. We got a young entrepreneur making some big moves. So let's get this show started. Here we go. Three, two, one. Shut up and sit down. The Business Bros Podcast was created for you. Learn from the business professionals who come to share their stories. Find out what's working in business and social media, what's hot and what's not, straight from the mouths of successful entrepreneurs out there doing the real work. And now, welcome to another episode of Business Bros. Let's do that Time to drop the heat. All right, all you business pros out there, before we jump into the show, just a quick reminder to please subscribe on whichever platform it is that you're listening to us on today. Give us a like, give us a follow, subscribe, drop a review, help other like-minded business owners find value from our awesome guests while we rise up in those podcast rankings. We'll sincerely appreciate every single one of you for it. And if you want to be a guest on the show, we'd love to have you on to learn from you as well. Go to www.businessbros.biz, schedule your time slot. Don't forget to follow us on all our social medias at Business Bros Podcast. All right, everybody, we're so excited and honored to bring yet another incredible guest to the Business Bros Pod. Our guest today might be the youngest guest we've ever had, a fact that in and of itself is incredibly inspiring, but just wait until you hear this guest story. Our guest is an 18-year-old entrepreneur who's been seeing the needs of different markets and building businesses based on those needs, get this, since the age of six. Not to mention he's already written three books focused on helping young people get into the game as well. Upon entering the social media marketing realm two years ago and seeing the industry overrun with overpriced and ineffective marketing services, our guest set out on a mission to provide, well, exactly the opposite for his clients. By partnering with our guests, you can get non-traditional marketing techniques from organic and paid traffic, content creation, social media management and advertising, and more. And the best part is having this visionary young entrepreneur on your team who is seeing the future from the eyes of the generation that's next to start buying. Joining us today from Star Social Media out of Westchester, New York, three-time author of Teen Entrepreneurship and Teen Investing, welcome to the show, Jack. Rosenthal! Hey, hey, thanks so much for having me. I really uh, love that intro. That was a cool intro, man. Um, so I guess what do you guys want to hear? Just a quick little re- recap of some of the stuff I've done, or what do, you, what do you guys want to take this? Man, let's just jump into this thing. How about that, Jack? Six yes, years sir. old when you're starting. You have three books written by the time you're 18. I'm gonna share a little story with you, and then and because you're you're doing exactly what I what I love to see young people do. So I teach a high school class called financial algebra. So I'm trying to teach 17 year old kids what it's gonna be like out there in the real world. It's everything from managing money to investing to starting a business, all those different types of things. And then here you are implementing those types of things. And you're not one of my students. Let's lay it out there. First of all, you're not one of my students, but you're doing all these things. Where did that inspiration come from? Yeah. Well, the inspiration really came from my grandfather. Um, he, he passed away recently, but he, he was a big instrumentation or big, um, uh, big inspiration in my life. He, he was the one who got me started in buying my first stock at eight years old. And he's really been kind of a principal teacher to me in investing and kind of finance. And I'm really lucky that I had him in my life for as long as I did. Um, so yeah, he's, he was really my inspiration. And then the other inspiration I had when I was six years old and I started, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second when I launched my first business is it was just like, drive like it was just passion like you know other kids were passionate about throwing a basketball and they wanted to throw a basketball for as long as they can remember and the second they got a basketball in their hands they just throw they've been throwing it in a hoop and they've been doing that ever since they're a little kid same with football same with chess same with cheerleading same with acting whatever everyone seems to kind of have this thing just as long as as long as they can remember and as young as they are they just had a passion for it that's always been my thing with um with entrepreneurship and yeah, I created my first business when I was six years old, coolpaperplanes.com, which I was lucky I was able to get the domain name back then. Cool Paper Planes. <laughs> and that, that website's had 60,000 visitors since, maybe 70,000 now. And basically the idea was to sell paper airplanes over the internet. Very simple business. Started when I was six. I think I made like 70 or or $100 uh, from selling paper airplanes over the internet. Very cool, very exciting uh, venture. And yeah, I ran that when I was six. Dude. 
Okay, so I, I gotta ask this because people get into entrepreneurship for all kinds of different reasons. What is the thing that drives you? Is it is it making that 70, 80 bucks? Was it like yeah. something that you wanted to buy as a kid? Like what what is it that pushes yeah. you or compels you to to start a business? Well, two things. And by the way, I don't want everyone to think that like that was the only thing I did when I was six years old. And I'm uh, I'm a great entrepreneur today just because I did something <laughs> when I was sick. So there's more to the story just to let other people to let keep them on the hook. Um, but yeah, it was the drive was honestly it was two things. Like I, I don't think I would have started the business if I didn't make any money out of it. Like I don't think just purely out of the idea of wanting to supply people with paper airplanes would have drove me to start the business. So there was definitely a money a money component. Obviously, seven dollars to a six year old. It's like a huge amount of money. You're rich, bro. You're rich. A lot, a lot of ice cream. A lot of ice cream you can buy with that. A lot of a lot of stuff. Um, so yes. Yeah, so one aspect was the financial component, and then the second was just yeah. Like I said, I kind of had a passion for it. I really liked doing it. I enjoyed doing it. Paper airplanes was a hobby of mine at the time. So kind of combined everything everything I like doing into one thing. All right. So you have this idea. You're going to get into selling paper airplanes. You're six years old. So, you know, the, the thing about being young is you want to push young people to go try it, right? To go taste it. Go go give it a shot. You know, if, if this is something that's going to be part of what you want to do forever, then you might as well take a leap and get started today. Blues will always whine about their yep. best. Yeah, totally. Right? 100%. So, so you, um, y you probably came across the very same problem that entrepreneurs at all ages and, you know I'm, I'm rounding getting close to 40 here and, and we run into the same situation you probably did which is i have an idea i have a product or a service how do i get people to fit to, to find out who i am and buy from me right totally totally um okay so a couple things so with this business i created a website that was kind of my virtual storefront I think it's just the combination of it having a cool domain name plus advertising it to family and friends. Like, you know, we told, you know, people that were even worked in the same office as my grandfather would be like, oh, like, you know, check out this website, you know, for any, you know, you guys have any parties or anything like that. You can order paper and payments off the website. I think that's the kind of marketing we did. Once again, this was 12 years ago and it's not the only thing I've done. So, but, but I'm pretty sure that's how we were able to market to uh, customers at the time. And yeah, we ended up selling about 70 airplanes for a dollar each. That's what we sold them for back then. Back then, mail was less expensive. We mailed them to people in the mail. And uh, yeah, that was pretty much the business that I created. By the way, as far as the author thing, the link that we put below for everybody, that's where you can go find all my books. So if you're interested in my books or if you're, you know a son or daughter or cousin or someone like that who might be interested in teen investing, go check out in the description below. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's take a shift then. Uh, what are those books about? Right. And again, I'm going to come back to that same question. How do you get people to figure out and, you know, to know who you are, to go and actually find the books? What are we doing? What are you doing yeah. now? You know, I mean, obviously you're not six years old anymore, right? <laughs> you, you've learned a yep. lot since then. So how are you growing your customer base? How are you getting more people to know who you are? Totally. So uh, there's, it's kind of like two different things. Writing a book and marketing a book are two totally different things. Um, I did both, but a lot of people are just good at one or the other. So, uh, so I wrote. So I wrote my first book when I was a senior in uh, senior in high school. Just finished up, or was it midway through my senior year? I wrote my first book, Teen Investing. Uh, that's been my flagship book. There's the biggest market for invest teenagers that are interested in investing, so that's why that book has sold the most copies. Um, and then I wrote my second book, Teen Entrepreneurship, in the middle of my freshman year of college. And then also came with my third book, Teen Investing 101, which is a terms book of investing terms. Um, so as far as how I marketed the book, yeah, because just listing a book on Amazon isn't necessarily going to get you a ton of sales. I did a couple different strategies. Um, the first one is obviously family and friends. I mean, that's just like a great way to get a 20, 30 easy sales right there. Plus you get some reviews on Amazon, which is really instrumental for marketing the book. Like no one's going to buy a book that doesn't have like at least 10 reviews or something on the book. So getting those initial family and friends reviews is really helpful. And honestly, if, if you're a starter author, I'd recommend just giving away 10 copies just to get the reviews. So that's the first thing. Second, I did is I went on a, some podcasts uh, to promote my book and my brand, my personal brand and the book. Um, so that drove some traffic to the Amazon. Also, it was just I mean we I was serving a really good market. Like the the teen investing market, I think there's only like 
couple other books written on teen investing at the time. Um, the biggest one was written by a website called motleyfool.com. Anyone who knows mm -hmm. fine probably familiar with them. They wrote a book for teen investing along with many other books they've written. So they were number one and then my book quickly became number two uh, in the for the teen investing category. So and so between that, um, there's a lot of demand in the category. I was a teenager myself writing the book. There's just a lot of kind of organic interest for it on Amazon and that really led to a lot of uh, strong sales. I am uh, curious as to what kind of feedback you got from the teenage community, from your peers. Did you know people who read the book who are who are looking to implement some of the strategies? Um, what kind of what kind of feedback did you get? Was it specific towards an investment strategy? Was it towards uh, like the the readability, the stories in the book, or did you get like? Because I know for me in the classroom, I mean, I have a class of like thirty five kids, and like five are interested in investing in business, and the rest are just like, I'm just trying to get by. I'm worried about senior prom. I'm worried about grad night. Not too worried about that sort of stuff yet. So, what kind of feedback have you been receiving? Oh, well, so everyone who re reads the book, so obviously those five out of 20 kids in the class, they're already interested in investing. So yeah, the feedback that I get from those kids is phenomenal. It's been, the book has been taught now in some college classes, which is really cool. Like it's been brought up in some lectures, um, college classes, not just high school classes, even though it's for teenagers. And in addition, yeah, so, so as far as what those kids are, the kind of feedback I've gotten, it's all been very great. I put my email at the end of the book. So every once in a while, like, you know, every month or so, I'll get like a random email from a kid in the middle of the country. Like, hey, Jack, read your book. Really cool. Thanks for uh, thanks for writing it. You know, do you have an advice on try buy this stock, that kind of thing? And uh, and yeah, it's been really cool. And all the feedback I've heard so far has been has been phenomenal. What's the core, uh, if you can summarize teen investing, like what's the core strategies that you're asking or sharing with them? Uh, because obviously the, you know, the, the power of compound interest, you can do the math on that and see what happens over time. But the problem with teenagers oftentimes, it's not that in investing isn't interesting. It's they don't got any money, right? Like for yeah, the most that's, part, that's they're exactly getting money from I, their parents, I, right? I hit the nail on the head on that with that exact point on the book. You know, the biggest thing teenagers want to try and invest like a hundred dollars. I'm like, dude, it, don't waste your time trying to invest a hundred dollars. Like the processing fees on the account alone will like just kill you. Like, what are you gonna do? You're gonna invest a hundred dollars and earn ten dollars a year. Even for a teenager, ten dollars a year, a dollar a month is is not a lot of money. So, so yeah, that's why in the book I kind of give I give eleven examples of ways first you can earn money, and I say your first goal in life is the first thing you should do before you start your investment portfolio is bank your first $5,000. I know to a teenager, it's like, oh, that's a lot of money. But if you really break it down, it's not very out of reach for a teenager. If you work a summer job at about $10 to $15 an hour and you work, I don't know, five days a week and you're working, I don't know, let's say 20 to 40 hours per week at a summer job, which what else are you doing at the summer? Not much. I know I'm a teenager. Um, and you work a summer job for one summer. By the end of that one summer, you could easily have saved up about four thousand by the end of the summer. Not to mention, if you work multiple summers in high school, you can easily get your five thousand target. It's going to take some discipline. You can't spend the money once you earn it. But between that and gifts you get from parents, instead of like getting a gift as a toy or something, just get it in dollars or get it in stock. And within no time, you'll have a portfolio. You'll have a dollar amount to five thousand dollars saved up. And then you should go and invest it. And then I talk about some different strategies you can take in investing it in the book. And that's really the plan that I give for every teenager in America to build a very strong investment portfolio by the time they're 30. You said 11 ways to generate income as a teenager, right? Yeah. Let's go into some details on that because honestly, you can help me out a little bit. I'm about to start class here in July with a new <laughs> batch of seniors, and if we can, you know, if you can help me come up with stuff, you know, from an, from a teenager's point of view, what I can do to help get these kids to the point where they're earning some income, because uh, I, I for me that's that's awesome. Like I, I start every single year almost the same way. I'm like, look. The things we're going to do in this class are applicable to life today. You can go out and use these skills to go out and make money. My goal is that your senior year costs you nothing out of pocket because you generated the revenue in class. So if you can help me out with some ideas in generating revenue for a 17-year-old, dude, I'd be eternally grateful. Yeah, totally. Okay, so I'll give you I'll give you three A's. First, uh, most obvious is get a job. Like That's like the kind of overlooked one because it's not sexy or anything, but 
getting a job is overlooked. There's no startup capital like there is for starting a business. Uh, you know, you can just kind of jump right into it. There's not a lot of high learning barrier, especially if it's a simple job. So that's number one. I know that's obvious, but important to bring up, especially if you can get a you know decent amount of hours kind of job. Number two, this is one that I've done before. Start a vending machine route. Very cool business. Uh, gets everyone's excited, everyone's attention. The idea of owning like a little money box that you can just get money from every week. Who's who's not going to get excited about that? I know a lot of mm -hmm. adults that get excited about that. Um, so so basically, the way that that works is first you have to find a location. It could be anything. It could be if your barber shop's really busy, it could be your local barber shop. And uh, yeah, I know that I know from personal experience. Uh, teenager boys can typically be close with their barber, so it's not too hard to convince them to let them, put, you know, put a simple candy machine for a, for a low end kind of low income producing vending machine to up to a snack vending machine to a higher income producing vending machine, and a snack machine, I mean, a little candy machine, even one of those can make like fifty bucks a month if you just have it good candy and you know collecting quarters, um, all the way up to a couple hundred dollars per month with one of the uh, one of those snack larger snack machines. So the hey, first thing you got to do is go get a location. It could be an office building, could be whatever. Um, second thing you do is you buy the vending machine. Typically recommend buying it used. The used vending machines can range anywhere from like usually a thousand bucks for like a decent snack machine. Uh, that's like one of the larger kind of snack machines. You can buy like a smaller tabletop one. For a couple hundred bucks, you can buy a candy machine thing for like 200 bucks. So they kind of range in pricing. But find the location first, then buy the vending machine. And it's a great way to make, you know, like a couple hundred bucks extra per month as a teenager. So that's uh, that's idea number two. Idea number three is you can become, there's a couple different ways to do this. You can become like an eBay seller where you take like junk from people's houses. So like instead of someone doing a garage sale or something, you just kind of offer like a full service where you just sell all the items for them and you take like a 20% fee or 40% fee or something like that for listing a whole bunch of person's old crap that they don't want on eBay and managing the sale of it and taking the photos and doing all the doing all the labor work and you can take like 40% of the net proceeds. Um, so anyway, those three ideas right there that any teenager can do. Dude, that's money right there. I mean, so from from most of the, I know the vending machine probably gets a little pushback because they're like, I'm trying to make money. I don't have any money yet, but that's a good way to kind of use the money that you're making and compound it essentially, right? Put your money to work for you. Uh, but I really do like the eBay one because, you know, I, Gary V also does something like that. He's like, dude, there's, there's a free section on Facebook Marketplace. There's a free section on Craigslist. Go grab some crap. It's free. Get your ass up. Go get it. Take some pictures and resell it. Uh, and, you know, it costs you zero dollars to to get into it and you can make all the profits on the end. And the way you're setting it up, I mean, you'd be making connections with real estate agents and, and title people and just go out and say, look, when you got something you need to sell, let us do it. We'll take care of it. We'll handle it for you. Yeah, you got real estate, agent, real estate agents. Great. You know, you got a whole, a whole a old couple that's moving out of their house. They got a bunch of stuff they need to get rid of. Yeah, go go hit, hit, connect them with me. But anyway, yeah, continue. Yeah, no, I mean, but and you're talking 40% of the net. I mean, dude, here's here's something that, that I don't think a lot of students understand is nostalgia sells. And when there's an old person getting rid of a bunch of stuff, that's a lot of nostalgic stuff. You never know. There could be one item in that collection of stuff that puts you over that five grand marker at that 40%. You just, I mean, it's amazing what people will pay for when you're finding stuff, uh, stuff around. Have you done that personally? I've been to a garage sale a couple of times and I flipped some stuff on eBay where like I did like an eBay arbitrage. I was able literally able to find stuff on eBay and then sell it for a higher price uh, a while later. Like if you bid on auction stuff, some, some stuff goes for crazy pricing on auction. Like I found like a $400 retail laser pointer that goes for like $72 at auction. I was like bidding on it. Um, that was just, that's just for fun stuff though. I don't really do a lot of that stuff just because I have some other businesses that are, it's, it's more, um, so it's more efficient for me to put my time in other businesses, but that's like definitely a business I'd recommend for a younger teenager that isn't doing as much. All right. So what, what, uh, what's fueling your fire right now? What's pushing you and wh where, where's your focus and attention on other than the three books that you got, obviously, what book, is it? Yeah. Well, the books is itself a business. I mean, I never thought that like books would bring you a monthly source of passive income. I didn't really realize that when I wrote the book, I, I, can, I actually wrote the book to give it away to people. Um, that was the, the original story behind me writing the book is I wanted to give it away to a group of kids. So I wrote a book on teen investing and then just gave it away to everybody. And then I realized that the information on it would be really valuable for any teenager in the country. So I listed the book on Amazon. Um, and like I said, yeah, the book is a 
is a cool source. It takes no effort. I mean, I got to go on some podcasts every once in a while, but this is like fun stuff. Um, and and yeah, and I sell I sell books every single every single day. So so that's the book selling business. And then yeah, as far as what takes my time and attention is I run a marketing business where I help businesses manage their social media pages. And that business I've been running for two years now, and that's that's really my main like job, I guess you could call it. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit because social media is powerful. This is where people are congregating, right? What people don't understand about business is if, I mean, we've talked to over like 600 business owners on, on the show. It's it's crazy the number of, of entrepreneurs that we've talked to. And almost every single one of them is looking for one thing and it's more customers, right? If more, we can help and, them get more after, customers, yeah. say that again? I was going to say, and half of them know they're not doing enough on social media. Yes, exactly, exactly. And how do we get customers? We, we basically put up a sign that says, hey, I'm doing business. Do you need this particular product or service? The key is where do I put that sign? I want to put it in front of the the people that are that I'm willing to do business with, that people that are willing to do business with me, that know, like, and trust me. How you know? Explain to me how social media is creating more business for your clients. Okay, gotcha. All right, so first of all, it's a little bit about the clients. So basically what I found is like a gap in the market where there's your typical, I haven't served a particular kind of client with this exact demographic, but like this is a great example of a type of client. So like it's an 80 year old guy, he owns a meat shop. He doesn't know anything about social media. He knows that the meat shop, you know, in the other town is on social media and that's helping their business a lot. He knows he needs to get on it. He doesn't understand it at all. He doesn't want to pay a full-time person to do social media because his business isn't big enough. Um, but he likes the idea of hiring a smart young kid to go over and take over his social media and do it for him for a monthly fee. And that's basically the, the, um, the market that, that I tapped into and served. So, yes, yeah, so that, that's basically the type of customer that we're dealing with. Okay, so as far as how it's helping them. So let's say it's like, let's say it's that meat shop business, for example. If they have no social media presence, just creating one, I mean, it just does a whole bunch of things. Like one, people are finding them, their customer, their existing customer base is following them on Instagram. So they're more likely to kind of resonate more with a brand. If they see a new item that they might not have seen because they're not on like email list or there is no email list or anything like that. And they see posts on social media, they're likely to come in and get it in the store. It's kind of like an ad. However, the great thing about social media is you can kind of keep posting ads over and over again for free if you have a large enough following on Instagram. Um, and like for something like a restaurant, it's not, it doesn't even look like an ad. If you just post a picture of some food, no one even thinks of it as like, oh, this restaurant's trying to sell me the picture of the food. But really, that's all they're trying to do. It just kind of looks cool. Um, so anyway, like let's say let's say with a meat shop, you post pictures of meat every single day. It gets like the latest meat in front of the, your, all your customers, so they're more likely to come in, or they're going to come in if they see a picture of meat they like. That's number one, and then number two is discoverability. So let's say someone's just hopping around on social media, whatever, scrolling through their Instagram feed, they've actually been looking for some you know local delicacy, and local you know special kind of meat that they're like. They go on Instagram. They see all the different meats that the off shop offers. They think, "Hey, I got to go in and try to shop that. Try that shop one day." And that's pretty much how it helps the business. All right, so that's social media, uh, and I think you mentioned that you also do paid ads after yeah. that, right? So yeah, yeah, how, okay. Yeah, these things they work together, right? So it's one thing to have on social media. It's another thing to do paid ads. Why take the leap from social media to paid ads? Very simple, like scalable. You you can only scale so much organically. You can't really scale beyond that point um, without doing paid ads. Like all the big brands, most of what they do is just paid ads. Um, so yes, yeah, so once a business's social media following is big enough, you know they're posting consistently, they kind of tap that end out. Then the next step is paid ads, where you're basically reaching people that you wouldn't otherwise get to reach through Facebook and Instagram ads, promoting your products and services, generally for these types of businesses to businesses to a local area. And that, that's the whole goal of doing the paid ads. All right. And now I'm going to go, uh, uh, maybe, you know, ask you some, some uh, right. more direct questions, but you can kind of ball you know, ballpark uh, specifics if you like. Um, right. What kind of revenue does a, does a marketer generate, right? And what is the customer looking for in return? Like what kind of ROI for the investment that they're making on you? Gotcha. Okay. So typical client, I mean, if it's like a local kind of pizza shop, I've experimented so much with the pricing. You know, I've like, you know, always thought like at first I thought I was underselling, underselling myself. So I brought the price up, brought the price up. I started this business actually three years ago now. My first client was 
fifty dollars a month. <laughs> great start. I, uh, like a great start. But I was like, I was looking. I was like, hey, wait a minute. This is more than a candy machine makes, and all I got to do is dig- do it for my phone, which is easier than a candy machine. I don't even need to go to the place. So at that point, it was like this. Is not even that much bad money for a 14 year old. But anyway, so what I did is I kept raising my prices, kept raising my prices, a lot of different philosophy on how much a small business can afford to pay for marketing. But generally what I found the sweet spot is around $500 per month is what the typical kind of like pizza shop can afford or can afford and is willing to pay for social media marketing. And, and when you transition that into paid ads, um, so if, yep. if we have a teenager, for example, that's like, dude, I can do social media stuff. I do. I'm on social media all the time. Uh, I can, I can learn to do paid ads. I learned about that. You know, I learned how to manage, you know, business, uh, Facebook manager, business manager. I learned how to do YouTube stuff. You know, what, what, how do I charge this stuff? Do I charge, do I include my, uh, ad spend and do I charge and complete a, a, a project on the outside and then just charge for my time? Like what's, the, what's after you've been testing a couple things, what's been working for you? Yeah. So for the first thing you offer is social media management. And then that's like just a flat fee just to do the management. And that's typically the first thing I'd recommend a teenager start off doing just cause you're a lot more familiar with it. You don't need to learn as much like you would with paid ads. And you don't need to ask the business for as much money. Like, right, if you do a paid ad campaign for, let's say, $1,500, a thousand of it needs to go towards the Facebook ads, and you're only going to get to keep 500. So, that, but it's the business is looking at is you're they're paying you 1,500 per month, but meanwhile you're only getting paid 500. Versus the 500 thing, they're paying you 500 a month, but you get to keep the full 500. So that's why I usually recommend that's a good place to start for teenagers. Then once you're ready to kind of scale up or scale the businesses you're working with or the customers ready to scale up, then. The only thing you can do is start a paid ad campaign. Typically what you do for those is you charge a flat fee to manage the ad campaign and then the ad budget is up to them. However, usually you don't want to really recommend a business start using paid ads if they're doing anything under $1,000 per month of paid ads. That's what I've recommended. Like spending a couple hundred dollars of paid ads, it'll get you some engagement, but it's not really going to move the line a lot in terms of revenue. If you're really selling them on revenue growth, it's got to be at least a thousand dollar minimum on Facebook ads. Then you could charge a flat fee to manage that. With a thousand dollars, I'd say five hundred dollar fee for creating the ads and running the ads. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's that's how I price that. And obviously, if they want to do two thousand, then charge a higher monthly fee, that kind of thing. All right, and you know it's funny because uh, when I first started getting into business space right after i had a company that failed and one of the main reasons that it went down uh, in burning flames is because i didn't understand taxes i got into the tax business to learn from you know a previous mistake and i started doing tax returns for people uh and i would sit down in front of a client and mind you i was like 21 years old so i had a baby face trying to talk to a client about retirement investing that sort of stuff with a young looking face uh it was kind of difficult but when you're talking social media and and uh paid ads all of a sudden and that young face is working to your advantage what's been your experience when approaching companies uh that that want to work that you want to work with yeah 100 percent. you stand out like right let's say you're you're in, let's say there's 100 candidates interviewing for position but you're the only one who's 18 or 17 believe me they're going to remember your name if you're like i'm 17 years old and like i think i'm just as qualified or more qualified to do this than the older people you're gonna, you're no matter what, you're gonna be at least at the top of their mind or one of the top people in their mind, which is that's all you need. And then you do a couple of different applications, and as long as you're the couple top of mind for a couple of different applications, you're very likely to get one of those jobs. Mm. Dude, you are tearing it up, Jack. I can't. I mean, 18 years old, already managing multiple uh, social media profiles, doing some Facebook ads. I my, my final question to you. Actually, I got two, but my final uh, actual personal question is. What does the future hold for you? Like, where do you see yourself going? And are, do you see yourself getting a job? Do you see yourself having a typical type of career? Where do you see your future? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll probably, I will definitely complete college, which I'm a freshman at Babson College right now. Uh, or I've just finished my freshman year. I'm a soft, rising sophomore now. So I'll Congrats. complete college. And then I will probably, for the first couple of years of my career, I'll probably be working on Wall Street. Um, at an entry level job on Wall Street, just because I think that's going to be really important to kind of learn financial knowledge and just overall financial knowledge. I obviously have a big passion for finance, as I've written a book on it. Um, and yeah, that's that's where I see the future a couple of years out. 
Nice, dude. All right. Last little thing. Uh, you're in the creative space. Um, you've seen our social media stuff. You've been now a guest on the Business Bros podcast. What advice I got for you guys? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me what your experience was like. What did what advice you got? All right. Hold on. Let me pull up your uh, your Instagram here for a second. My Instagram is actually hacked, so now I got to pull it up in a private browser. I'm interested. I mean, uh, you, this is what you do on a regular basis, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now actually I hire people to do it, but that's another nice. that's another whole aspect of the uh, – It's a whole the, different I, part of the originally business. I was I, originally <laughs> I was doing it. Then I figured out how to teach someone how to do the same thing that I was doing. But I created all the strategy. Perfect. All right, let's go see what we got here. All right, we are at Business Bros Pod. Here, I'll just search on my phone. Makes it a little bit easier. All right, ready? Let's go for it. Out. On a quick jack assessment, free, free jack assessment. Business Bros Pod. There we go. Okay, four thousand followers, pretty solid. There's a nice, handsome picture of me. Nice. All right, so let's see. You're not getting a ton of great engagement. So where do those followers come from if they're not engaging with your photos? I think they came over time. Because, you know, and, and I'll be 100% honest, we, we went like, uh, whatever happened, and probably about year two, we went whew, really good. And then all of a sudden when COVID hit, there was a ton more podcasts that came out and we kind of hit a plateau and we've kind of just been settling. On, on the podcast rankings or on Instagram? Probably on the podcast. On the podcast rankings, on uh, Instagram growth, on Facebook growth. On Facebook, we're, I don't know, somewhere like around almost 8,000 or something like that. But same thing. We hit a plateau. Yeah, you guys have a lot of followers, but you're not getting any engagement. I mean, you're only getting, you got 4,000 followers, but you're getting nine likes on your last post or 16 likes, 34 views. That means only 34 people watched the post to begin with. And Hence the uh, organic. Yeah. So, okay, okay, so a couple of things here. Um, in order to get your engagement back, I would say you guys should start doing definitely some collabs with other podcasts. I actually see that as a great angle for you guys. I think like doing some collabs, especially on social media with some other podcasts, trying to get them to, first of all, comment on your photos and you comment on their photos, number one. So kind of create like your own little engagement group, post stories about them, have them post stories about you. Like when their podcast comes out, post some stories about them. When your podcast comes out, they'll post some stories about you, get you guys some extra views. You'll all collaborate and grow together. Comment on each other's posts. That way your followers will see that they commented on yours and vice versa. Same thing with Facebook if you want to grow that. Um, in addition, you guys can launch a little bit of paid ad budget. That'll help incentivize to get some more cooler guests, obviously. I'm a pretty cool guest, but other cooler You're guests cool that, guest. have, that have like giant brand followings, let's say like, I don't know, uh, 100,000 uh, followers on Instagram or 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, something like that. They're not necessarily going to come on unless you can show them you're going to bring them a ton of value. So if you take, let's say, a clip of the podcast and put a $50 promotion behind it on Facebook, you can get easily, I think, like mm, a couple thousand views of that mm -hmm. clip on Instagram and then you could say all oh, our podcast episodes get like 5,000 views or this one got 20,000 views if the clip goes viral something like that so idea number one uh, comment on other podcast groups kind of form your own podcast group maybe like five different other podcasts comment on all their posts they'll probably comment back on you guys uh, post stories about when they post that's number number two post stories about when they post new episodes they'll post stories about when you guys get new episodes just DM them to kind of like figure out a little arrangement number three do like a quick like 10 20 50 dollars of ad spend create like a quick little video clip of the podcast run that on your Instagram and Facebook that way one more people will find your podcast and discoverability make it like make the writing very clear like go follow us on our Instagram page or go check out the podcast to see the full episode so you put the link to that in the ad so you get more views on the actual podcast itself plus you'll get a ton of views on the clip um, and those would be my three ideas right there obviously I have to do more in depth to give you guys some more stuff but that's three quick actionable ideas you guys can do right now Love it, Jack. And uh, you know what? And the truth of the matter is, when it comes to uh, when it comes to our Instagram or and our and our social game, it's been lax. The first year and a half to almost two years, I did a lot of what you're saying. I spent a ton of time going to other people who are in my space and just commenting on the comments, like engaging with people on the comments, going into stories and you know responding to people on stories and DMs. And and yes, at the very beginning, early on, it definitely helped. 
uh, with engagement. It definitely helped with views. But it is a full time job. It is something that people are you got to continue to do on a regular basis. And the ad spend that is on its way here very soon. Jack, thank you very much for being on the program, dude. I mean, very insightful and super impressive at 18 where you're at already in your life. Uh, Before we head out, can you tell people the title of the three books? How can they find them? How can they get a hold of you? All right. Yeah, cool. So first of all, the books, Teen Investing on Amazon, Teen Entrepreneurship on Amazon, Teen Investing 101 on Amazon. Just type in my name, Jack Rosenthal, and they'll pretty much all come up on Amazon. Just type it in the search bar. Um, second, if you guys want to follow me on YouTube, which I have 500 subscribers and counting, you guys can go follow my YouTube channel, Jimmy Duke on YouTube. I create a ton of cool videos there around social media, marketing, and teen investing, just cool content on there for you to go follow me. So that's my YouTube. And those are pretty much the two plus places to uh, to find me on the internet, Jimmy Duke on YouTube and Jack Rosenthal on Amazon. All right, last thing, oh, I almost called you Jimmy. Last thing, Jack, um, what was your experience like, like on our podcast? You've been on a number of different podcasts. How'd you feel about ours? Oh, yours was cool. You guys got a lot of energy. I like that little intro music in the beginning. I've never seen like a custom intro music to the guest. Uh, I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah, so overall, I really like the experience. For, for also a good amount of time as well. Not too long, not too short. Not too long, not too short. Straight to the point. Ladies and gentlemen, go check out Jack. I mean, 18 years old, wrote three books, started his first business at six years old. I thought I was cool. This dude is on fire and he's just getting started. If you're a teenager, you have a teenager, you want them to get their head on straight, you're going to want to contact the, you know what, just go check out, uh, what was it, what was, James, drop it on the, on the thing right here, right? It was Jimmy, Jimmy what Duke. was it, Jack? Jimmy Duke. There you go. Jimmy Duke on YouTube. Go learn a little something. Implement a little something. Try a little something. You never know. You have your phone on you, teenagers, right? Or parents, you have a phone on there. I just want to get them in a position where they can at least pay for their own cell phone. Give them the opportunity to succeed. Jack's doing that by writing the books and sharing it with everybody coming on the show today. Jack, thank you very much for being on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, ladies and gents, we'll see you guys manana. Peace out, y'all. Have a great rest of your Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Thank you for listening to the Business Bros Podcast. Are you looking to get more clients or to increase your income? Hernan, the business bro, can help you generate referrals through the power of podcasting. And James, the insurance bro with Pipeline Insurance, can help you effectively add insurance to your existing business. If you are ready to create wealth today and generational wealth for tomorrow, email businessbros at csfirst.com to schedule a free consultation or join the Business Bros Network, www.businessbros.biz.